ich finden. Thank you, Derek. So very nice to be able to um, support the Anna Kampa project in Ayachanda in her retreat. Let's see if you like to Does that help? Not sure. Anyway, there we are. And uh, so I'm speaking to you from uh, Sacramento in California, and um, we were evacuated from our monastery and the evacuation order just lifted. So uh, we're actually sort of in the process of going back, but I'm speaking to you from an evacuation uh, temporary Vihara that was kindly offered to us. So, so let's uh, begin with some time of meditation. Still people showing up. So find a posture that's comfortable enough and supportive where your body is, uh, is not having to struggle. But it's also not too comfortable. So a sense of uh, alertness uprightness and also relaxation is this middle balance. So be aware of your body in contact with the seat beneath you. Just bring your attention down to the contact of your body with the seat. And let yourself fully rest into this place right now, right here. Be aware of your breath, body breathing. Just notice if there are any constrictions or you know, if, if there's a sense of anticipation or dullness or maybe pulling away or, or pushing away, pulling, you know, pulling towards something more, you know, mind's being pulled towards something more attractive or feeling aversion to pain, any of those things. And just recognize if that's what's happening, you just recognize that and direct your attention to that which is more neutral. So the breath is a neutral object. It's, sometimes it can be hard to pay attention to it because it's, uh, it's what, we, what we take for granted all the time, most of the time. But it's neutrality is a real support in our practice. So just being aware of any constrictions or pushing or pulling going on within the body and mind. And recognizing that we don't have to be pushed and pulled around. We can stabilize our attention. Being aware of the body sitting here. And bringing attention to your breathing, breathing in and breathing out. And just let your attention rest on the breath. Take an interest, get curious about the in-breath and the out-breath.
And you know, much of the body is involved in the process of breathing. With each in-breath, there's a lot of movement of the torso and throat and head, nose. And the out-breath, same. The whole body gets involved. Just paying attention to the body breathing. Just being present with each movement of each breath. Noticing any change of texture of the breath, or length of the breath, or temperature between the in-breath and the out-breath. So just noticing what is the breath telling us right now? As I say this, I want to just caution you not to be in your head thinking about the breath. This is about being with each breath. Mindfulness of breathing in and breathing out. It's a direct knowing.
So some time ago when uh, Ayachandra and I spoke about uh, this teaching, the theme came up of why is attention? And uh, the Pali term for wise attention is Yoniso Manasikara. So before I, before I go any further, I know I'm, not, I know I'm a little bit, uh, the lighting isn't great. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, great. I'm just going to do a little something, I'll be back. So the, the Pali for this uh, quality is uh, yoni so manasikara and uh, the word yoni <clears throat> is the word for womb. So it's uh, like the origin, going back, going back to the roots, going back to the origin. And uh, manasikara is, is, uh, is two Pali terms put together, so there's mana, Manas, which is like the mind, the, the thinking mind, the um, rational mind, and um, karoti, so manasikara, karoti uh, is the second part of it, comes from the word, the second part of that word comes from the word karoti, which means to, to put together or to, to make. So it's, um, it's about Uh, and, and there's, so there's yoni so manasikara, which is wise attention, and then there's a yoni so manasikara, with an a in front, <clears throat> unwise attention. And, uh, you know, the mind all the time is, is putting things together. That's, that's what the minds do. So the manasikara aspect, the attention aspect, or the, the putting things together aspect is going on all the time. That's what a mind does. And so then it's our um, work and uh, practice as Dharma practitioners to, to recognize what's going on there. You know, it, what, what is the mind doing? What are, we, what, are, what are we paying attention to? And in what way are we paying attention? And, um, and where does it lead? So in the meditation just, just before, you know, there's, there's always some instruction in, you know, what to do with the mind in meditation, with various different instructions. And, you know, there's the there's instruction and then the intention to do that. And then there's the, the habits of the mind that, that you know, so if, if the mind is really well trained, then it will go to the breath and, and absorb into the breath and have a wonderful time. And if it's not so well trained, then it's going to be with the breath for a breath or two or three. And then it's going to want to go somewhere else and start thinking about something else, getting involved in something that seems more important. And so part of the quality of wise attention is to know that, you know, to know what's going on, you know, where, where is the mind being pulled to? Where's our attention being pulled to? And, uh, and then how, how much clarity there is there around that? You know, are we just letting it go there and wandering around in that, you know, whatever it is until, until we get bored with that and then we come back to the, to the, to the breath? Or are we recognizing, are we paying attention? Are we actually recognizing that or you know, actually to this time I'm doing this. This is the time of being mindful of the breath or mindful of the body or cultivating metta or whatever it might be, the wholesome things that you might be doing. This is the time that put aside for this. And then the mind wants to pull away often. And uh, if it's not well trained, they want to pull away and get involved with something else. 
So in our full meditation practice, this is a really good time to see the tendencies of our mind, you know, where, it's, where it leans towards. And, uh, and not to, not to criticize it, not to, not to criticize and judge ourselves, you know. So if we're intending to sit and watch the breath for 30 minutes and, and then we just find that there's a lot of aversion arising or confusion or we want to, we want to get up and do something else or, you know, it's not to then uh, get critical and judgmental but to, re to remind ourselves, no, this is a training. This is a, this is a mind training. So we're just, we're just not doing that now when we're doing this. We're not going to the fridge now when we're doing this. We're not going to worry about the future now we're going to do this and the feel of the brain. We're not going to rehash that old story that we've rehashed a thousand times and the feel of the brain. And so it's, uh, it's this training of the mind to, to bring our attention into, into presence and into alignment with, with what will benefit us, with what is wholesome, what is beneficial. And, uh, you know, these days, I think it's, uh, you know, in, in the old days, when the Buddha was around, life was much more simple in some ways, you know. Um, it was more, more kind of practical and immediate for many people and, and now we have uh, so many um, so many distractions I mean there always are so I'm sorry you know the world is distracting but we have like refined version of distraction these days and there's a Sufi Sufi mystic who lives in the in the California who likes to use the term weapons of mass distraction for things like cell phones and laptops and you know, those, all that stuff. You know, the things that we so easily just get distracted by, get absorbed into. There's a little ping notification, oh, something's, oh, you know, ping email, oh, you know, and then, so there's just this, there's this um, normality really of, of distraction. This has become a normal thing to be, to be pulled into whatever pops up next. And so to really use discernment and uh, restraint in, in these things and to put aside time when you're really paying attention and getting to know the way your mind works, where, where the attention goes. And when you cultivate that clarity in a more formal setting, and when I say clarity, I mean clarity of what's going on. You know, ideally when, when the mind is trained, it will settle. It will settle with what is wholesome. And when it isn't, it will go here, it will go there, and it will pull here, it will pull there. And so we need to know the tendencies of our own mind. And like I said before, not with judgment and criticism, but just with interest, just like to, to know what you're working with. So it's said that uh, just as the dawn, you know, the light, the dawn light, is the harbinger of the sun. It uh, lets us know that the sun is, is close behind, it's going to rise. So wise attention is the harbinger of the noble eightfold path. So when there's wise attention, when we're paying wise attention to what's going on, then you know, we can't just get lost in the hindrances in the same way as when we're not paying wise attention. So uh, wise attention, it supports the ari ar arising of the awakening factor. Those qualities that are, that have the, they have the flavor of awakening in the, in the present and they lead to, to greater full awakening. So wise attention supports the you know, awakening in the present. And unwise attention supports strengthening of the five hindrances. So the five hindrances being you know, sensual desire, ill will, sleepiness and dullness, restlessness and worry and doubt. So those are the five hindrances. So when we're not paying wise attention, 
we're feeding those five hindrances. They, they, they're looking for ways in and they find their way in and they have some fun. And uh, when, we, when we use wise attention, they, they may still come in and then we see them. Ah, I know you, I know ill will, I know sense of desire. I'm not going to be fooled by you again, right now. Or even it might be more, much more of a struggle than that. Like, I really want that thing, but if I follow that desire, it's just going to be the same old, same old. You know? How many times have I looked for satisfaction in that ice cream or a movie? You know? And how long does it last? You know? Why am I looking for it again? If it, if it worked, I wouldn't be looking for it. I wouldn't be wanting it. Again. If it had satisfied my desire, I would be satisfied. The, you know, because you know, many of you in the UK, that I remember that advert, I don't know if it's still around, but years ago, the marathon, which might not even be called marathon anymore. And it, it, and it would say, marathon satisfies you. And they even wrote it on the bar, you know, on the packet, marathon satisfies you. Like, mm, for how long, you know? So, so if we were really satisfied by our desires, by following our desires, then we would just be dwelling in a state of, of peace and well-being. But following desire doesn't lead to the satisfaction that we're looking for. So, so maybe a desire arises, I really want that something. And then instead of just following it, we can say with wise attention, with Yoni Sikara, we can see, oh, there's an opportunity here to strengthen letting go. So instead of following that desire, I can, I can pick up the this quality of letting go and feel what that feels like. You know, feel the tug, feel the, the, the struggle, feel the loss perhaps, and then, and then the peace that comes at the end of that. And the joy actually that can come and a sense of um, strength that can come through not just following the old patterns. So uh, it's uh, wise attention is, is uh, it's really like the, the very beginning, it's like the, the essential first step to really, uh, you know, for, for wanting to align our lives with, with sila, with the precepts with uh, cultivating wholesome qualities, with letting go of what is harmful to us and to others. It starts with wise attention. And, and, you know, and there's the aspect of wise attention that's knowing what is wholesome and what is unwholesome. So it's got a discernment in it. This is the wisdom or the wisdom quality. Discer discernment, which is not the same as judging. Judging it has a... a a negative quality to it. It's you know good and bad, right and wrong. So it's more discerning. Is this going to be beneficial or not? Is this is this aligned with the path or not? Is this wise or not? Is, this, is that quality? So it's a wisdom quality. And so it has that quality, and also you know to to um, so it, we see something arises, and then we, we see. Would it be good to follow this or not? What should I, you know, what do I want to do in, in any given moment? This is always up. And, uh, and then when one makes the choice to go in, in the direction of the wholesome, to keep that wise attention going, like, and now what? And what, is, what does it feel like? And what is the result of that? And, uh, and what happens if I don't do that? In the times that I don't follow, follow the wise way and I follow the unwise way, what are the results of that? Where does that lead? So it's so really encouraging. The Buddha really encourages us to think for ourselves and to explore for ourselves and to find the path in our, in our life, in each moment. And, uh, and part of the quality um, of wise attention is to really see things as they are. So 
So the whole of the path is inviting us to see things as they are. And the tendency of the personality is to not want to do that. You know, we want to, we want to, um, we want to see things as beautiful, as lasting, as as me and mine, as uh, as satisfying. You know, we want to we want to believe that life can give us this. You know, this ever changing world can give us lasting happiness. We want to believe that. That's sort of the the personality of the ego wants that so much. You know, don't tell me that things are changing all the time. I don't want to hear that, you know, a beautiful flower is going to fade and die. You know? I want to hold on to the to the pleasure and the joy and the beauty. And I don't want to don't tell me about suffering and death. You know, I don't want to hear about that stuff. You know, so that's the in the position of the often of the ego. Of the, of, or of the untrained mind. And then when we turn towards reality, when we turn towards truth, at first it can feel a little scary and a little uncomfortable because it's not telling us the story that we're used to hearing. And so maybe we want to feel like, oh no, I, I don't want to hear that, I should shy away. But there's something. There's a wisdom inside that's saying, no, this is true. Look at this, look at the person. And so there's a, you know, it needs, needs to be a little bit of faith you know, just to, to take a step in that direction and to turn towards the reality of things as they are. And then when we do that, even if conditions are challenging, there can be a, a peace and a joy because there's an alignment with things as they are. So, so I'm speaking to you from a, a, our evacuation monastery, as we call it. It's, it's a house that was offered for our use. And uh, for the last, what has that been? Just a little over two weeks, uh, we've been away from our monastery and, and watching the map every day and oh the, the fire is getting closer and, oh it's getting closer and, oh my goodness it's getting closer and, oh my goodness it's on our doorstep and you know watching the fire get closer to our monastery and, and um the monastery is in a very very beautiful forested area so you look out over miles and miles of forest it's very very beautiful and so thinking about that, I'm like, oh gosh, will there be any Christ left? I'll just be the little black sticks on the mountains. And, um, and then yesterday we went back to the monastery for the first time since we were evacuated. And you know, the, the key buildings are still standing, which is, is a great, great blessing. And uh, thanks to many people's prayers and, and uh, chanting and also to the really awesome firefighters. A few of them were there actually when they arrived. So the main building survived and then other, other parts didn't. You know? the parts of the forest are completely burnt out. And some of the view is still green and some of it is grey with black sticks sticking up that were once beautiful pine trees. And uh, you know, so we spent some time there yesterday walking around, looking at what has been destroyed and what is still standing and putting out water for the deer, because we normally do that, but we haven't been able to for a while, and for the birds and called the little stray cat, which hasn't turned up yet, but it may. And, uh, you know, it could be really distressing to see the beautiful kuti, the beautiful meditation heart that was built last year by a dear friend. Just a pile of rubble in the forest. Or the, the lovely terracotta yurt. There's a beautiful two yurts, but a beautiful yurt that was tucked in the trees that a, a very dear friend had sponsored for us to be able to get this yurt some years ago. And it's been a place of practice. Now it's just... Hmm. A bit of uh, a bit of rubbish in the forest. Now that could be really distressing. It could be really sad. And 
and what each of us, there were three, three bhikkhus who lived at the Loki Bihara, what each of us found was that it's, there's a peace to it. It's like, oh yeah, it's, so that's gone. There is no meditation hut anymore. There is no terracotta work. There isn't even the tent platform that was made that seems to have crumbled. And some of the trees that were very dear have died. And that's happened. And it's like this. And there's a sense of, it's nature, this is nature. So I think it's in some ways made it easier because there's no enemy. There's no, no arsonist, there's no, um, you know, there's nobody coming to try and uh, destroy the monastery. It's just nature. Nature has happened. Nature is happening. And part of nature is forest fires. It's actually a natural part of the ecology here. And so there's this sense of like, mm -hmm, you know, and walking around the forest and seeing the, fallen trees and burnt, burnt out areas and, and it's like, yeah, this is nature. This is natural. So one can take issue with nature, you know, you can, you can rile against nature, but it's just going to make you all unhappy. <laughs> and one of the translations of the Dhamma is nature. Jim Buddha Dasa would always translate often translate Dhamma as nature. So nature is, you know, it is, it is teaching us all the time. It teaches us about birth and death. It teaches us that what is beautiful is beautiful for a little while and then it changes. And after a while we'd probably even call it disgusting, slimy, smelly. You know. The beautiful vase of flowers, if you leave it for a while, it starts to get quite gross. And that's, that's the nature of things. So wise attention is looking, looking at that in a way with clarity. Not in order to, to say the world is disgusting and I don't want anything to do with it, not to, not to arouse aversion, but to see things as they are, to know things as they are. And, and you know, it seems like if only we had what we want, if only we get what we want, then we'll be happy. I mean, how long have we been doing that? I mean, how many times have we done that since we were little kids? I think I get what I want, then I'll be happy, you know? And then you get it and then you're happy for a few minutes and then you're not in it. So we know that, we know that. And, and yet without wise attention, we just keep on following that same pattern again and again. And it's actually, it's this uh, paradox really that when we, let go of what we think is the, you know, the things in the world, or the relationships, or the, or the identity, or the status, or any of those things. When we let go, when we let go of, of wanting those things to give us happiness, the letting go is in itself is what brings happiness. It's the letting go that brings peace, that brings well-being not getting. When I first came to America in uh, well, visiting to look for a place where, when the first the ICE institution when I first came to look for a place that we might make uh, a monastery, we traveled to different parts of the country and, and in one of the states, uh, we were in, I'm not going to which one it is, but actually, in one of the states we were in, we were driving, we were being driven through this, this area and uh, there were these big billboards, there were these big signs that, that can stick up in poles and, and uh, you know, the advertising different things that are going on, you know, like car sales or, you know, supermarkets, whatever. And there was this, <laughs> there would be these signs that just had the word stuff. <laughs> Like you can get stuff here, you know. That was really funny. It was like, okay, they're just like selling stuff. It's not even trying to pretend to be anything anymore. It's just stuff. And uh, I think there's something honest about that actually, you know, because 
Yeah, how much stuff do we get? You know, how much time do we spend buying stuff? Beautiful stuff, delicious stuff, interesting stuff. Or we or on the phone, you know, on our phone, we can get more stuff and more stuff and more stuff and stuff in our mind full of all this stuff. So how much of it is beneficial and how much of it isn't? How much of it is aligned with the path? How much of it will really bring you peace and well-being and happiness? And how much is it just more stuff? So this is a really important for, you know, for all practitioners, this is really important for us to, to be aware of and to, and to investigate you know, how much of what I'm putting in to any of the senses, including the mind, how much of what I'm putting into this body and mind is also beneficial, leading onwards, and how much is just you know, maybe even toxic or, or irrelevant or too much, and then also what we're putting out, how we're meeting the world, how much of it is just old habits of reaction, and how much of it is aligned with the life hindrances, and how much of it is aligned with the awakening factors, the awakening factors, mindfulness, sati, investigation of dhammas, investigation of being interested in what's going on in the ritual. Energy, video, um, kiti, joy, rapture, kasadi, karma, samata, collectiveness of mind, and upeka, evenness, or equanimity or balance. And how much of so using that, but using those two frameworks of the hindrances and the awakening practice as a as a guide. So when there's a yoni so some uh, unwise attention, the hindrances will get stronger. And they're called hindrances because they hinder us from seeing him, from being with the way things are. They hinder us from being awakened. And, uh, and then seeing when there's yoni so when there's wise attention, that will immediately arouse the awakening factors. And they're called awakening factors because they lead to awakening. So they're important, they're important, wise attention. It's a, it's a small thing and, and it's, it's a small thing to remember. Is there wise attention or not? It's, but it's, it's everything. You know, without that, we, we're not even getting started. Or each time that it's not, it's not, um, each time that wise attention isn't being used, when we're not directing our attention in a wise way, then we're directing it in an unwise way. And then we're strengthening those old habits that have, may have had us following them for, you know, could have been lifetimes. We've been running after pleasure in wrong places or running away from simple realities of aging, sickness, and death. It's my life. You know, so when we you know, don't really pay clear and wise attention, just, we just keep running. running, running. And uh, with wise attention, there's an opportunity to settle into things as they are and respond in a way that's Forward leading in the path. So I just, that's all for me. I want to just offer that uh, as a reflection for you. And, uh, and I would be really interested to hear from you um, how you engage wise attention or whether you engage wise attention or whether you have any questions around it. And uh, Remy, how, how, do, how is this done normally? Do people put up the mechanical hand or what happens? Uh, yeah, they can uh, put up the hand using the raise hand button or uh, 
How should they? They can also can just raise a hand and then. Oh, just raise a hand. Yeah, and then they can see whoever to ask questions. So yeah. Or if anybody wants to type it in in the chat box, it's also fine. So anything will do. <laughs> Oh, you're very quiet. See, I'm used to used to Americans who love to speak out. <laughs> so um, let me see. Maybe I need to frame a question for you. Oh yes, thank you. Yes, Terry um, would like to speak. I'm just going to ask you to unmute. Uh, it was interesting what you say. It's as though, uh, particularly in the West, uh, we've built a work a world that goes against everything that you said. It's like testing us all the time. Um, the idea that uh, you should be uh, successful, you should be able to multitask so that you're doing two or three different things at the same time so that you're never giving any true attention to anything. And it's Sometimes I feel um, a slight alienation from the world that I'm living in. That's, uh, you know, because what I'm trying to do in myself is against what is being encouraged by everything around me. Uh, you know, the sort of avaricious consumerism, capitalism gone bananas, uh, without any restraints, uh, those sorts of concepts. Well, thank goodness that you are not going in that direction, eh? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I mean, I think, you know, I think it's, it's very, very obvious nowadays, you know, because it's so blatant, but I think it's always been that way. You know, people have always wanted to enjoy delicious and wonderful things and you know sense pleasures and and you know there've always been wars and and you know exploitation and all of those things have been going on you know they were going on in the buddha's time and and he was radical in his uh, present you know his presenting the dharma and, and it's like the teaching goes goes directly against the way of the world mm. In, in, in many ways, even though part of the way of the world is there is care and there is kindness. So that these qualities are part of every, you know, every being actually, human and animal. So there is care. And so I'm even actually just speaking at the Bahara, um, back at the local Bahara, there would be these, uh, there's quite a few lizards, and it's quite hot there. There's all sorts of different animals. And, and there would be these two lizards that would sit on this, on the back step, and they would have their arms around each other. They would lie there with their arms around each other, these two lizards. So it's like, even the lizards, you know, maybe even the lizards have a little bit of care for each other. So there, there are those beautiful qualities that are, that, that are part of the world, the part of normal world. And then there's all of the stuff that you can talk. And I think that's always been like that. And I think, we you know, a spiritual practitioner is going against those ways of the world. And, and I think it's so important to do that. And then to have some go, like to have that like now, just seeing everybody here together on the Zoom, so that we have each other to support that, that practice. And it's not, it's not a bad thing, you know, it can feel a little isolating, but it's not a bad thing to be standing against that blood that the Buddha speaks mm -hmm. about. It's good. And that's that, and that will also strengthen you. you know, if, you, if you reflect on it in that way of like, yeah, the world is going in this direction and that's not the direction I want to go in. And so if you imagine, if I don't know if you've ever stood in a river, when the river's, um, you know, you can stand in a strong river, but if the current's going in one direction and you're just standing still or even trying to go against that, it takes a lot of effort. And it can feel like, oh, it'd be so much easier just to go along with it. Yes. But in that, in that standing against, or in that walking in the other direction, or swimming in the other direction, 
you build up so much strength. You build up a lot of strength and vitality. So it's, it, it works. It's, it's, you know, the spiritual practice is strengthening as you do that. There's a question in the chat, so I'm just going to read that out. Um, what is the difference between mindfulness and attentive attention, or maybe wise attention? Um, so mindfulness, so wise attention is, uh, it has a reflective quality. So mindfulness is, you know, mindfulness is, is a quality of attention that we direct onto the body, feelings, mind, mind objects, it's more knowing. And why is attention is I mean, Yonis Omosikara is, is it's got more, it's got a more of a sort of reflective and maybe a little contemplative aspect. So the yoni aspect is getting to the root. So so for example, bringing wise attention to um, the three characteristics. So it's it's so like bringing wise attention to the to the the fact of everything is changing, or bringing wise attention to the fact that you know even however hard I try, following my desires doesn't lead to lasting satisfaction, or bringing wise attention to you know this this that I call me and mine isn't really under my control as much as I would like it to be. It's, it's, it's nature doing its thing, this body, this mind. So wise attention has more of a reflective quality and mindfulness is, you know, mindfulness is like, so if I bring mindfulness to the body, I'm aware, I can feel, you know, I'm aware of the physical body lies for me. And if I bring wise attention, then there's, there's mindfulness, that's, that's still there, but there's also, a recognition of the nature of the body. So it's a, it's a little bit more you know, yeah, reflective. But mindfulness belongs with wise attention. And mindfulness, sati, is the first of the awakening factors. So when there's wise attention, there's sati. Okay, and another question in the chat by Anna. Um, what can be done if thoughts keep popping up in the mind during meditation? I try to get back to my breath, but they keep popping up. These thoughts concern work, my family. Of course, they come with tension. Sometimes I get the feeling that the more I try to be calm, the more they press in. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's great. Thank you for, for laying that out so clearly. That's really helpful. Um, Yes, so it sounds like the thoughts um, are thoughts that you have worries and concerns about, uh, things that are that are you feel maybe need some attention. We need to we might need to make some decisions around. We might not know what to do or, or feel a certain sort of pressure. So uh, there is a need to attend to things. So there's a time for formal meditation and there's a time for attending to our life in, in other ways. And uh, if we don't attend to things in the, in the more ordinary time, then when we go to sit, all those things come up and they want attention. It's like, oh, finally, she's got still for a little while. Let me just try and get her to pay attention to these things that need to be addressed. You know, it can be like that. So, um, one way to do that is to, you know, when you sit in meditation and those thoughts start to come up, to just say, right now, I'm going to be practicing meditation and set, letting the mind settle on the breath, or whatever your choice of meditation is. And, and you can even have a, an altar or a table, a to-do to -do table, where you, where you take those thoughts and you put them on the to do table for later and you say, this isn't the right time for you now. It's, it's making boundaries really. This isn't the right time for you now, but I'll come back to you later. But then you actually have to come back to them later. You can't just put it off to the next meditation. So that's uh, 
away because those when those thoughts keep coming up they keep pushing their way in like that it's because they need attention and they need wise attention so uh you know sometimes the wise attention is is uh feeling the anxiety we feel around something that we're you know something that we're feeling pressure around or you know, feeling the frustration that has arisen in relation to one of our family members who's doing something that's really difficult you know so wise attention can also be processing you know, being with the what, it, what arises from the, the, the challenges of our life but during the formal meditation practice it's a, it's a really beneficial time to learn how to make those boundaries like this is not the time for that so right now i'm going to just strengthen awareness with the breath with the body and then when you have that strength of awareness, you can take that into your daily life and you can spend some time you know, addressing the things that need to be addressed. And maybe also figuring out how can I, how can I meet this, you know? And sometimes we need to call on a friend or a, a professional who can help guide us how to meet difficult situations. But the, the meditation, the, the time of sitting meditation isn't the time to figure all of that out. That's the time to strengthen our awareness and, uh, and to trust that that will support us when we, you know, when we come out of the meditation and have to meet the various challenges of our life. I hope that was clear enough. Um, there's a question by Ricardo in the chat. Dear Aya, the simile of the deer herd, the Buddha described how Samadhi provides the refuge for cultivating the practice of the Noble Eightfold Path, yet that is a bit rare to attain outside of a meditation retreat. Is there anything that may help in supporting the cultivation of Yunisomani Sakara in daily life? Many thanks and with Metta. Thank you. Yeah, so yeah, the main thing really is remembering Actually, it says Yoni Samana Sakara, wise attention. It doesn't require samadhi. It requires remembering. It's just really quite, it's quite kind of uh, foundational, it's quite beginnings. And, and I, when I say that, I'm always a little bit cautious to say it in words like that because people think, oh, it doesn't really count then. It's just, it's just the early stuff. And then, you know, I don't want to do the, I'm not interested in that. I want to do the really important, fascinating, you know, cool stuff. And, but without Yoni Samo Sakari, you're not really getting started. So it's just to um, remember. So one of the ways is to recognize how, uh, how our, to, or to recognize our habits of perception. So we see, uh, let me see. We see a, um, I'm just going to use an analogy of something delicious. We see a, a delicious cake and uh, we think, oh, I love cake, that's really nice. And then, and then we get the cake and then we, we eat it and then we enjoy it and it's delicious, then it's gone quite quickly. And if we're really greedy, it's gone really quickly. And then, and then it's gone and then it, there's like the memory of it. Um, and and then we think, oh, maybe I should get another one because it's, uh, it's gone already. You know, so, so there's that, that's not using wise attention. And then using wise attention, you see the cake, and then you recognize, oh, that looks really delicious and it looks gorgeous. And like, but, you know, do I really need it? Can I actually afford to buy that cake right now? Is it going like, to give me the lasting happiness that I'm looking for, you know? And, and, and then it's like, it's just, you just bring it in. It's just using wise attention with each, each thing that arises in our life. So it's like, um, you could say that every moment of our life, life is a crossroads and, and we can decide if we're going to go this way or that way. This way, or that way. It's, it's like that all the time. You know, we, have, we know the big crossroads of our lives and then it just seems really, you know, get those build ups of what direction am I going to take? But there's the, Moment by moment, am I going to let go, or am I going to follow greed, or follow aversion, or follow dullness, or follow worry, or follow 
now. And then we're going to bring mindfulness. Get interested in, in what's going on. Reflect on it. And, uh, and letting go, really. When, when one reflects on the true nature of things, the response is letting go. So craving, where there's craving, there is suffering. Where there's letting go of craving, there's peace. So every moment is an opportunity for wise attention. We can also be around, uh, you know, stories of our of self. You know, we can get and have these voices in the mind that say, "Oh, you're like this, and you're like that. You shouldn't be like this. You shouldn't be like that." Some people have voices that tell them how how wonderful they are. I know a few people who have, you know, who think that they're. I mean, they know it's not true, but they have the stories that they're like really, really cool and really the best and really better than anyone else. And, and then, you know, they they know that that's not really the truth, but that's the story. It goes on, and then others. I think there's probably a more the majority who have the, oh, you you messed up, and you're not really good enough, and you know, you're a bit of a fool, and you know, you're doing it wrong. You know that those voices. It's also recognizing those voices that come in the mind, and, and knowing like, this isn't the voice of wisdom. This isn't the voice of compassion. This isn't aligned with the path. You know? So it's learning to recognize when. Our perceptions are being distorted and guiding them in the right direction. A question by James in the chat. Um, does the practice of meditation cause us to become aware of the cushion of thoughts that would otherwise go unnoticed? Like since doing it, I get frustrated that I get distracted so much during the day. But is it just that I am noticing it more? Also, I notice thoughts of ill will. Have they always been there, but have been subconscious, so I have never noticed? Probably, yes. Yes, that was my experience too. When I first started to meditate, oh my goodness, I had no idea how much judgment and criticism was going on in there constantly. So it can, it can seem at the beginning that you're kind of going way, way back, but actually what's happening is in the meditation, that you're shining a light on the, the tendencies of the mind. So yes, yeah, so if you're noticing ill will, the thing, the thing that's really important is, so, you know, when ill will, all of the hindrances are very tricky and they find ways of, you know, of, of getting a hold on one's mind and so so ill will so we're practicing you know you're, you're, you're aligning your life with the path and you want to cultivate those false qualities and and then you notice there's a lot of ill will and then quite easily if they're not being really cared for and using wise attention then we'll start to feel ill will towards the ill will we'll start to resent the ill will we'll start to judge ourselves for having ill will and that's just like ill will on top of ill will on top of ill will. So this is again where these awakening factors come in. So you're noticing, so first of all, there's you're noticing that there's, there's more and more ill will. So there's noticing. Noticing is really, really important. Noticing has sati, awareness as part of its quality. So there's awareness that there's ill will. And then there's also a recognition of ill will is unwholesome, and I don't want to cultivate that. This is this is good. This is wholesome. And then there needs to be a an investigation. And so I love this word yoni. So it's like getting to the root, getting to the, the origin of it. So where is you know what is going on that this ill will is arising? There's a there's a cause to that. There's a root there, and part of it will be habit. 
that the mind is used to going down that, down that, in that direction. And, and there will also be particular things that will, that will trigger it. So the ill will isn't about something outside. The desire isn't about something outside. It's that's the, that's the, that's the delusion. It's, it's in here. It's in our own heart and mind. So that's where we need to go. We need to turn back and look at where, you know, where, where is that springing from? And in terms of distraction, um, some of us are more easily distracted than others. So, um, so I, I have ADHD, believe it or not, so I get distracted. And because I know that that's a tendency, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be at war with it, but I'm going to recognize, oh yeah, I have some extra challenges here. So I need to work, to, 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 not just to work extra hard, but to take real good care around directing my attention, guiding it, and then not uh, giving up or not um, criticizing or blaming. You know? So, it's, so you know, we, we, we all have different um, material that we start with. You know, we, we've, all got, we've all got different karma, let's say, and one has to work with that. And, you know, and there's, there's been this, also with distraction, if we're trying to choose a, a, a focus that's too, too tight, too narrow in our daily life, we will constantly be distracted because lots of things are going on. So the four foundations of mindfulness that the Buddha taught really encompass everything that is going on in our world. Body, hearing tones, mind, and, and what's going on in the mind, the, the mood of the mind and what is going on in the mind. So, you know, there's also that way of, of framing our experience within the four foundations of, of mindfulness, so that mindfulness is still available. One more question. There are two more, actually. I'm, I received one privately, but I'm just going to um, ask this one now. Um, wise attention needs discernment, but how does this go together with the acceptance of the world as it is? Um, well, it's the discernment to see things as they are. It's the discernment to recognize the truth of the way things are. I'm not quite sure of the question actually. So, you know, when, when, when wise attention, when one's using wise attention, one is seeing, when one, one is recognizing things are this way. So the discernment, perhaps the discernment would be, you know, how to respond. So knowing that everything is changing, you know, that's, and knowing that everything is changing, everything's in a constant state of flux, that's alignment with the way things are. And then the discernment is, how do I, you know, how am I gonna to respond to, you know, am I gonna try and hold on to the monastery, for example, you know, we just have this thing of maybe there won't be a monastery. Should, am I gonna just hold on to, no, there's gotta be a monastery, put all this work into it. That wouldn't be very discerning because it, it could burn down. You know, it, it nearly did. So, so then the discernment would be, you know, I really want this monastery to continue because put all this work into it, it's a good place, and it's got all those wonderful Dharma books in the library, and it's got a lovely meditation room, and, and it might do it burn down, so let go. And then there's peace. I think we are almost out of time. Um, is there time for one more question or should we end here? Yeah. Um, okay, so the question is, how can we use wise attention to know how we can help? Mm. How we can help, dot, dot, dot. So I think that the um, how we can help, who, what, how, why, when. Um, I think the... Uh, you know, when one's aligned with reality, it is, it just simply is helpful. Even just the, uh, 
you know, not, not taking issue with things as they are is already helpful. And then, you know, we can still use our discernment and kindness and like, there's many, many ways people can help many, many situations. It's a very, very broad question. <laughs> so um, there are infinite numbers of ways of, of benefiting people and beings and the planet and, and our own lives. So what, you know, when there's wisdom and, and clear attention, it gives us a, a better likelihood that we will see how to respond to them. So the question is a little bit too broad for me to answer it in a clear way. It's actually a bit more specific. I didn't read the entire question, but it was given that the world is burning, I'm wondering how to cultivate wise attention outside of meditation. So many people are suffering and I want to help. And yet those ways of helping seem so small, like offering food to a friend in need. Yes. And then the question, yeah. Thank you, that's so helpful. That was much better. Yeah, and I, I experienced that too, actually, during the, shortly after we were evacuated, because just before I was thinking, oh, how can we help the people in the shelters, you know? And then suddenly we were being evacuated and then, and then it, you're, and you're away from, you know, it's like you can't, there's a sense of like, oh, I want to help, I want to do something, but I can't do very much, you know? And so what we were able to do here was align with the reality of the situation and, and uh, the accepting of it and, and, and continue to share teachings. And what we found was that people were reassured, felt a sense of reassuredness and uh, comfort in the fact that we weren't upset or freaking out or, you know, feeling that something terrible had happened, we were okay. So, so taking care of oneself, there's, a, there's this, the, um, the acrobat sutta, when, when one takes care of oneself, one takes care of the other. And, and by taking care of the other one takes care of oneself. So it's like, uh, if you don't do that, if you don't take care here of the sense of agitation that can arise, because you know, we can't make the world right. And I think this is, this is part of the problem is like, we see all of these things happening, we wanna, we wanna do something about it. You know, I was like, I wanna help those firefighters. And then, then I realized like, well, the best thing I can do for the firefighters is to evacuate and not be there. That is the most helpful thing I can offer right now. And, and that's kind of hard because it doesn't feel like very much, but it actually is the most useful thing. The most, it's, it's exactly what they're asking. Please just evacuate and don't come back until we tell you and let us get on with a job. You know, that's, that's what they're requesting, but it, it feels like it's not enough, you know, but it is what's helpful. And so those, and the little things that we do, you know, it's, it, it's, it's often little things. The little things we do for a friend or for a stranger or for a homeless person or for, for a charity or a shelter or an animal. It is little things. It's, it's many people doing little things that, that make a difference. And, you know, a few people do big things. And that's great, but it, we don't always have to do it that way. And, and that we also we live in a sort of celebrity culture where you see all these big things, grand gestures, and, and it's like, well, most of us aren't that, you know, we, we, but we are connecting with each other and we can do, and hopefully with ourselves, and we can do little things. And essential part of it is to take care of one's own mind and heart, so that we have a good so we so we so we're responding from a sense of wellness and not from a sense of desperation or confusion or hurt or resentment. And then we're giving something good into the world in, in whatever way it may manifest. It'll be different for each of us. Thank you. It's been really lovely to be with you today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aya, for today's session. It was really wonderful meditation and the Dhamma talk. And also the question and answer session, it's, it has been really a lot. And I mean, it's very like uh, enthusiastic, I can say. We got a lot of questions tonight. So um, I would like to, so for everybody who wants to join, uh, support and the Kampa Bikuni 
you can go to the website we are going to put in the what, chat. And then if you also want to support Aloka, uh, Aloka Vihara, you also have, uh, Derek has already put the uh, website, the link in the web chat, in the chat box. So yeah, support both of them, <laughs> I would say. So yeah, I would like to thank you all and thank you Aya for tonight's session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take good care. We're going to unmute everybody and then say goodbye. But before that, I will stop recording. <laughs>